Welcome to the inaugural episode of Sleep for Performance TV. In this episode, we're going to dive into sleep and performance for weightlifters. This is the first in many videos that we hope to make to engage our audience in Sleep for Performance TV and provide you with a number of different strategies to improve your sleep, whether it be for performance as an athlete or a shift worker. We hope you enjoy this video. Sleep well. Welcome to Sleep for Performance TV, our inaugural episode. Today we're going to focus on sleep and performance for weightlifting. So, as a bit of an introduction, there's three things I participate in. One is Medias Consulting. This is an organization where we provide support in health, safety, and business improvement to industry and elite athletes. Secondly, Sleep for Performance, while you're uh, probably the reason why you're here today you've come through this website or you know about us this is a non-for-profit site that provides videos podcasts free ebooks blogs newsletters and lots lots more so please head over there and check out all the resources associated with sleep for performance and finally i have an adjunct senior research fellow role at the university of western australia where i focus on the relationship between sleep and performance There's a range of clients we work with, from industry clients, as you can see here, mining, oil and gas, aviation, and so on. We also interface and work with a number of different universities around the world, predominantly with research-based students uh, completing their PhD. And finally, we also work with a number of elite athletic organizations providing support or research with them as well. And this is an interesting part of our business that we, uh, we really enjoy working on. So let's kick off with our first thing about recommended sleep duration. As you can see here on this slide, there's a number of different uh, age groups along the x-axis, and then we also have hours of recommended daily sleep up along here on the y-axis. So a lot of people will say as we get older, we need less sleep, and that's true to a certain extent until you hit about 18 years of age, and then you're gonna need between seven to nine hours of sleep per night. The reason being is that sleep is important for growth and as, when we're very young obviously there's lots of growth happening in our bodies and then as we get older less demand for growth in our bodies as well and we average about seven to nine hours of sleep per night now you will see some differences in this type of sleep um, over time primarily um, children between the ages of zero and up to about 13 or what we call lark chronotypes like to get up early and go to bed early whereas teenagers exhibit more of an owl chronotype where they like to go to bed late and get up late. When we become young adults, we then will either be a lark or an owl, or we may be what's called an intermediate in between. And then as we get older, generally over 65, we start going back more towards a lark chronotype where we go full circle. So there's different uh, preferences amongst people depending on their age and where they are in their life as well. This is all driven by what, what's called the circadian system, circa meaning about and dm meaning a day, which is controlled by this small cluster of cells here called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which sits in the base of the anterior hypothalamus in the brain. And this is regulated by light and dark cycles. So when light hits the eye through the optic nerve, it sends a signal to the SCN, which sends an inhibitory signal to the pineal gland not to make melatonin because it's during daylight hours, which then will have an increase in cortisol and body temperature during this time. And the, ad, the opposite then happens at night. In the absence of uh, sunlight, we see that melatonin is secreted, which sends a feedback loop here to the SCN, and melatonin is uh, secreted here at night for sleep on, to support sleep and sleep onset. Now, if you're a shift worker, or you have trouble sleeping, you cannot kind of magically flip these around. There may be some slight adjustments left and right of this curve, but you can never have complete melatonin secretion throughout the day and you know basically use your mind to flip it around it is impossible when we look at the stages of sleep that we get overnight there's a number of different phases which you're probably familiar with such as rapid eye movement and non-rapid eye movement so these are two kind of major phases in the night non-rapid eye movement happening in the first half of the night and REM happening in the latter or the last part of the night so we have wake, REM, N1, N2, and N3. N3 being the deep sleep. A lot of people would say that REM sleep is deep sleep, but it's actually the N3 sleep that is the deep sleep that occurs. Now, this is very important for weightlifters because this is when growth hormone and testosterone is released, and this happens in this first part of the night, so non-REM sleep is extremely important. 
However, th there is no difference in terms of importance of sleep. All of these stages are important for different reasons. In the absence of sleep, the body will always prioritize REM sleep. So we like try to catch up on REM as soon as possible. But both types of sleep are important for different reasons. On average, you should be getting about 20% of your night's sleep should be stage three or entry sleep. And um, the only way to measure this is by the application of EEG or electrodes to the brain overnight while sleeping. Unfortunately, sleep apps or wrist-worn technology will not identify these with accuracy. You can see here what happens on a 24-hour period from a circadian perspective. If we start here at six o'clock here, and we move ourselves around the sphere, we can see different things are happening at different times. So we're meant to be awake during these daylight hours between six and six, and basically, you know, asleep or at rest here in the evening during uh, hours of darkness. From the perspective of training, you're going to have the highest alertness in the morning. So if you're working on cognitive tasks, if you're an athlete, this is the best time, somewhere between 10 and 12 in the morning. Or even if you're trying to do an important meeting in your office or you're trying to study, this is probably the best time. After our circadian dip between 12 and sort of 2, 2.30, we see the best coordination, fastest reaction time. And in the context of weightlifters, again, probably the best time to lift weights for muscular strength is going to be somewhere in the evening between 5 and 7 o'clock where you have the highest blood pressure and the highest body temperature in a 24-hour period. Um, after this time here, between sort of 7 and 9, it's the forbidden zone or the wake maintenance zone. It's the hardest time to sleep in a 24-hour period. Now, many people will use caffeine before they go to the gym if you're heading in around 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening. In this study we did with Super Rugby, we found a relationship between the amount of caffeine that was consumed uh, during the game and as you can see here to the right hand side on this bar chart this was the pre-game caffeine levels and uh, post-game which indicated a, a misuse so to speak of caffeine because they basically weren't getting the full ergogenic or performance benefit from caffeine it was peaking after the game you would like this to be peaking somewhere in the middle of the game now because of that or due to the excessive caffeine consumption and the, and the missed timing of it this related to an increase in sleep latency the time to fall asleep affected the sleep quality or sleep efficiency and uh, was statistically relevant for lowering sleep duration as well after the game so if you are consuming caffeine for performance if you're going training it's probably best to consume that caffeine at least an hour before you go out to the gym so you can get the maximum benefit from the caffeine because Caffeine is also related to sleep, as we've just said, uh, in terms of it's going to affect it. And so after you consume caffeine, it's going to be very difficult for you to manage sleep onset um, until about five, four to five hours after training. If we look at sleep problems and disorders, about four in every 10 Australians are going to experience some form of inadequate sleep. And the most prevalent one that we're going to see probably amongst weightlifters is obstructive sleep apnea. This is a cessation of breathing when a person is asleep, either a partial or complete. And this will result in things like restless sleep, choking, sweating, and uh, heavy snoring, which may get reported by your partner in the same bed as well. So uh, this is all very relevant to weightlifters. And the reason being is that, number one, we'll see more men having it than women. Um, and number two, we'll see that 95% of people with OSA are undiagnosed. But more importantly, the third and final one on this to take note of is related to BMI. And so if your BMI body mass index is over 30, you have a 90% chance of having obstructive sleep apnea. And this is regardless of your body fat. So if your body fat percentage is quite low, even just that general mass um, and that kind of girt around your neck potentially could affect you or be a potential at risk factor for developing obstructive sleep apnea. Obviously, there's things that we can do to minimize it, so alcohol will make it worse, so minimizing alcohol consumption, where that body fat is distributed, distributed in your body as well, and it also gets uh, worse with age or increasing. Most often we see this is related to sleeping position as well, so lying in what we call the supine position on your back will exacerbate obstructive sleep apnea also. In athletes, we see um, there's no real discrimination uh, with athletes regardless of their, their fitness level or skill level. And to assess people for a sleep disorder, what we have to do is what's called the gold standard polysomnography, as you can see here from one of these players from the former super rugby team, the Western Force. And this is the application of numerous electrodes, as you can see in the picture, to the head, around the chin, uh, onto the legs as well, looking at um, respiratory effort from bands and so on. 
and um, looking at oxygen saturation. So this is an overnight activity that happens in a laboratory. If you're looking for the gold standard in lab, um, it will just be one night. Now it is difficult for people to sleep with all this on, but we're not. That's not representative of the quality of your sleep. We're just looking for the potential prevalence of a sleep disorder overnight. We can also as well. Uh, administer sleep questionnaires such as the insomnia severity index, upward for daytime sleepiness and the Berlin in relation to obstructive sleep apnea. So when we looked at this in athletes we found that when we compared the rugby players to the general population that rugby players had more periodic leg movement disorder as you can see here compared to over here in the general population mainly attributed to low iron levels and for sleep apnea nearly three times the amount of what occurs in the general population as well. So regardless of the fitness and the health of the athlete, sleep disorders can be prevalent and, and sometimes, in this case, were actually more prevalent. But in this group as well, all, all players or athletes reported excessive daytime sleepiness, which may be a factor of training, and reported insomnia as well. Now, if you'd like to know more about sleep and performance, not just in the context of weightlifting, but other things as well, you can head over to sleepforperformance.com.au to find out more about what we do. Like I said, lots of podcasts, blogs, media, and so on. So go over there and uh, check out Sleep for Performance, where we put a lot of info on there. Myself and our producer, uh, Ricky Christick, has uh, contributed to these as well. And finally, if you are looking for some support around consultancy services for health, safety, and business improvement, or ways to improve sleep and fatigue risk management systems, you can contact me at Medias Consulting as well based in West Perth in Western Australia. Hope you enjoyed the inaugural episode of Sleep for Performance TV. We will be looking at different topics on uh, sleep over the next coming months and we'll also be looking to improve the quality of these videos as well. This was a great test case to get out there. So hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, sleep well.